that village and within where we go, it's there to help uplift our kids and not knock them down or make them question what we are doing at home and they become even more confused and then they out there wandering, you know, aimlessly and not knowing what to do and then become a perfect victim for another lost person but they got a little bit more confidence to pull you in the wrong direction. I mean, is that what we're talking about? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I just want to salute every man out here because a lot of times you guys are the unsung heroes, right? And like he mentioned, you know, a lot of the things you do don't show up on the box scores, right? You know, when you when you're the one that has to, you know, unclog the toilet when no one else wants to do it. You're the one that has to clean out the garage when no one else has to do it. You're the one that has to go, you know, check what that noise what? is in the middle of the night. You're the one that has to take care of your, your child when they wake up from a bad dream. A lot of the things we do as men doesn't show up, but it, it makes a difference. It makes an impact. You know, I remember as a kid, you know, my, my, my dad would wake me up Saturday morning, nine o'clock in the morning um, to go, he used to do, um, he used to have an ice cream truck. He's waking me up in the morning to go with him to go sell ice cream. And I used to be like, uh, Saturday mornings, you know, you want to watch TV, you want to enjoy Saturday morning cartoons, you know, all of those things. And I, and I didn't know the impact it was making on my life, that work ethic, that ability to realize that he was out there grinding. And he, wanted, and he was just bringing me because he wanted to bring me. He didn't know that he was planting a seed in my heart. And so a lot of the things that we're doing, you know, even in this kind of gathering, are planting seeds. And so, like you speak to, it's all important that we continue to do these kinds of kind of events. It's funny to say, unclog the toilet, because I had to do that just before I came in. <laughs> like last night, like, Dad, can I, can I, can I see you, Dad? And I come up, you know, you got to put that, that, that good reverse punch to that toilet, can't nobody else do it. But I think that's the other thing. We learn to take joy in those things. And I think society, I don't know, for whatever reason, you talk about your dad getting you up. My dad was a trash man, so for everybody that, like, don't look, you know, it's like, oh, man, he's a trash man. I realize the power of that trash man. If you ain't got a trash man to pick up your trash, your neighborhood gonna be like dirty. But my dad was so much of a hero, man. I remember sitting in that in that truck, that trash truck, I would just see him, you know, grab them trash cans, dump that thing, run up and down the street. He was like a superman, man. And no matter what, once again, no matter what my dad did when it came down to being a dad and feeling those responsibilities and doing what he needed to do and being that example of being a proud man, regardless of what I went through, he was that perfect example. When everybody that was in his crew, you know, every we know we came up, everybody was uncle, cousin, Rob. You know, you were how many were really your uncle? That's just what we do. That's what the community is. And I think that that is so important where we gotta be proud. And, and I go back again, I think sometimes it's kinda of hard to talk about the issues of what is a duty of a man. I believe me, whenever something goes on, I'm on the front line. My family's back there, my wife's back there, my kids back there. I make the sacrifices for my life so they can have a better life. I mean, do, do, do you agree? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, do, do we all agree on that? And I, and I think some, sometimes, it's a, especially in today's world, it's almost like you can't say that or you don't want to say that. You want to, why is it that we, we, I mean, that moment that I told you when I got in trouble, I worked so hard to become the man that my dad sent me to do, and then I look around and then I'm like, man, I tell people, look, I don't care what goes on. I ain't giving that up. I work too hard to get, you know, to understand this definition I'm still trying to define. But once again, I think collectively, we all define it. The one thing that I say was so awesome about the dojo, and I tell everyone, we've been here almost 29 years. So from the first time I came here, I didn't know what I was doing as a dad. As a single dad, I didn't know what I was doing. But every dad that came here from Chinese to white to black to whatever, I'll go back and I tell them, thanks for showing me how to be a dad. Because I seen what they were doing. I seen how they were taking care of their kids. I didn't, I mean, I know what my dad was doing. They showed me a whole nother level. They showed me how to like get them in school, take them out of school, how to do all the things that I'm benefiting from now. So I just think that we, once again, we got to be open enough to communicate and take those lessons. How do you feel about that? Yeah, absolutely. I call us, like we're the everyday superhero. Like, you know, you boys are sitting next to a superhero. You don't realize it now, but your dad is a superhero. You know, and, and it's funny because you're not going to realize how much of a superhero your dad is until the future. And sometimes, you know, you don't appreciate everything your dad is doing. So I just want to also, you know, let the boys understand that, you know, your dad really is a superhero. And, and you know, you, you, you know, you idolize the Spider-Mans, the Supermans, you know, all of these guys. But your dad, you're literally living next to a superhero. If you know what he carries, Sonic. You know, you, if you know what he carries every single day, you know, you would, you would, you would be in awe of everything that your dad carries and what he has to, you know, embody. 
and, and, and represent. And, and unfortunately, sometimes um, we get busy with life and, and sometimes life happens and before you know it, you know, your dad's, you know, your dads are, you're all grown up and now you're looking back and reflecting all the things your dad did. And so it's so important that we take time to salute the men who are there doing it every day, grinding every day. That's what we are, we're grinding. We don't need anyone to give us appreciation. We don't need anyone, you know what they said? They said Mother's Day is the second most celebrated uh, holiday. Of all the holidays, Mother's Day is the second most celebrated. You know where Father's Day is? 25th. Father's Day is the 25th most celebrated holiday. And why is that? Because we, and no one's complaining about it. We don't need that. Men, we're just in it every day. We do it because it has to get done. That's it. No excuses. We just get it done. And that's how we, we are, and that's how it'll, it'll, it needs to be. Um, and that's why I appreciate the most about us as men. You know, we just get it done. Yeah. And, 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 and even when I'm saying that it's like in public, you got, it's like, man, should I really say that I'm doing this man thing? Because everybody going to look at me like, you know, rude. Or I, I know, like, when I go out, a lot of times when we go out, I'm like the quietest person in the room. I always take the corner. I always look around. They're like, why are you so quiet? What's wrong? Because I, I know something wrong is going to happen somewhere. So when, it, when wrong happens, I got to catch it before it happens. And then I don't care about no credits. Like, oh, well, such and such did this. I'm going to go over here in the corner. And I think it, that, once again, when I'm, even when I speak to the young men, like I tell my sons now, it's like, look, everything that I do is for you to take care of your mom when I'm gone. You're learning how to be a better man right now. It's your responsibility on knowing how do I make mommy happy? How do I, how do I, I don't care what, and all of, one thing I always tell them, don't ever try to argue with a woman. You ain't going to ever win. Leave it alone. Keep quiet. It's not until you get older that you realize, it's like, let me just like, let me just like, yeah, what I call a little puppy, just don't say nothing. And then in the end, it'll turn out better. And um, and I keep teaching them that, because it, 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 I, I see it now, like, maybe especially my, my youngest is like, if it's my, I won't always be clashing, right? But then they then they find it harmony, and it's like I'm teaching, like, Messiah got him out, Messiah just let it go. It ain't even about winning in the argument, it's just about really trying to find that peace. And I think Lord, showing the young men how to communicate and, and being able to be that sort of balancing act within a relationship. If you can do it with your mom or your sister, when it's time to be able to, you know, one day sell off and get married or something, you'll be better able to do that. And I think those are the things that's so important that we that we try to do in the dojo. But I think we as men coming together, like last time when we did it, we were saying, what can we do to keep this going? Because I don't know about you. I mean, I have I do have certain people I can talk to. You know, sometimes I'll, I'll text them, but really, think about it. There are many places you can go to as a man to talk and be a man, to really talk about what you're going through. I mean, how do you, how do you feel about that? Yeah, you know, uh, back in February, um, I lost a good friend of mine uh, due to uh, suicide. He committed suicide, and he was about 51 years old. And, and um, you know, we had known each other for a few years, and, you know, we, we never really saw the signs. And, and you're seeing this almost wave of, you know, men who are just seemingly okay on the outside, and then all of a sudden this thing happens. And I think, you know, we need to have things like this where we can express and talk. We bottle it in. You know, we're you know we're taught from the young age to just suck it up. You suck it up. You know, you just do whatever you got to do, but don't express the emotion. I think that's unfortunate because I think when we are able to talk and work things through, Liam, Liam, sit up. I'm playing. Sit up. And to add to that, you know, I, I would agree. I think it's it's important to have balance, right? But to your point, you know, we as men, we take on everything, we take on whatever we can, and we don't think twice about it, right? Because that's that's our role. But you got to have that balance. Because at some point, everybody has a breaking point. You know what I mean? To, to your exact point, everybody has that moment where it's like, I put one more thing on, and that was it. You know, so you got to have you gotta have those outlets, those balances where you can say, all right, I'm shutting everything off, I'm shutting everybody out. I need I need my space, I need my time just to detox and then come back for us. Yeah. I think that <clears throat> things like this are definitely important. Like that we really just have you have that outlet, you know what I mean? Where you can just be you for a second and then step back into that, that role in the front line. Anybody else? Um, yeah. Uh, I try to impress by my son that um, I'm not going to be here forever. So his, his role is to step up. You know, I, 
Uh, again, my name is Mark Brown. Um, I'm new to the class. I've been here since January. Um, trying to tell myself, I'm not going to be here forever. So you can't give your mom and your sister all this grief all the time. It's your job to step up when I'm not here. Uh, there are times when, you know, it was close to me not being held up. And uh, three combat tours, two in Iraq and one in uh, Afghanistan. And um, he, didn't, he was young then. He didn't understand that his dad might not be here sometimes. So I'm trying to press upon him that right now, that he has to step up. It's hard for him because he's got some things going on, but he's, he's a good kid. And I just try to tell him that he has to step up and take responsibility for certain things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? And you know, one thing I was thinking about as we were thinking is that um, a lot of times, you know, unfortunately, other things are raising our kids. And I think as men, you have the ability to, to speak over your children. You know, the power of words, you know, scripture says life and death are the power to come. And you can speak over your children. And one thing that I realized is that everyone wants to put a label on a child. Label the child this, label the child that. But what you don't realize is that as men, as fathers, you have the ultimate authority. Whatever you speak over your child is what your child is going to become. So don't let anyone else speak more over your child than what you're speaking over them. Don't let the school system, don't let society, don't let the government, don't let everyone speak what your child is going to be. You have the ability to speak and decree what you want. You can literally speak into your child's destiny, speak into their purpose, because God obviously had them come through you. And so you serve not only the purpose of raising them, but the purpose of speaking into their destinies. And so that's one thing that I was thinking that we could do at the end is have every father just take time to just start speaking over your children. Just begin to declare, even if they're not here. You don't have to, and you don't have to be their biological fathers. A lot of times, like you mentioned, there are some key figures in our lives that raised us, even if they weren't our biological fathers. And so, you know, if we have time at the end, just just let, let's let do that principle of speaking over our children and see the impact that that will make. Because early on, I remember growing up, the school system tried to put a label on my brother. They tried to say he was this, he was that. And my dad was like, no, that's not who he is. No, we're not going to have to give him this and do this and all this. I'm going to speak over my child. And you can see what he's doing today. You can see what all of us are doing today. It's unbelievable. And so um, that's one thing I just wanted to share on that part. And, and, and I, I do agree because my dad is that way. You know, it's funny. I do martial arts, but my dad don't do martial arts. And I always tell people, but the last thing I do, my dad always say, you do a kick, you do a kick, you're going to lose your toe. As my dad always say, throw a punch, you're going to lose it. You're going to lose a finger. That's just my dad. He's like, I brought you in this world. And I, and I know what society might say, but my dad said, you, I brought you in this world, I'll take you out this world. You know, and I understand it. It's like, it's like a, a love and hate relationship. It's like, I just know he don't play. I don't care how many trophies, I don't care how many awards I got. When my dad come around, I don't even talk all that black belt stuff. He'll tease me like, come on, boy, you want to do something? Come on, show me what you know. Let's go. You know, his little joke is that you might know karate, but I know crazy. Come on, let's go. So it's like that. that it's, it's that generation. You have that, that, that certain thing is a line that you won't cross. I don't care what my dad say. I don't care what my mom say. It's just a line that you won't cross. And I think that's so important. Honestly, I mean, my kids tell you that. I mean, my oldest one is different, but I say, we're the same way. I grew up in the world. I take you out this world. Don't get this twisted. I don't care how many kids you know. I don't know how many punches you know. Outside here, I'm your dad. And that's what's so that's beautiful. So we do have those conversations. I mean, the beautiful thing that I can say, I have so much confidence with, with my, my sons where him and Sai have been this conversation. We can have these wise conversations. And I listen to, and, I, and maybe that's the different thing that I learned. I learned to listen to them. And I learned to realize that they might not have the wisdom, but their creative opinion might enhance my situation. And it does, you know, it, it helps me tremendously for my, my my oldest one who when I say, yeah, man, he like, dad, you're a little too soft now. You don't beat nobody no more. You don't do none of that. Oh, I was, it was, but the method is different now because I don't have to do that. And that was a trying time for me to be able to learn how to better communicate with him, with all of my kids. And, and the other thing for me too, anything that society puts out there to try to destroy them with, we talk about. The one thing I learned, I'm going to introduce you to explicit music. Let's talk about that. Because honestly, what I realized, if I don't introduce them to it, society's going to introduce them to it. It's going, it's, you know how when we came up, it was always, you know, let, let me testify. Even though they say don't testify, let me, I, I can do it. I can probably go around there, oh, man, I got burnt, you know. And 
What I try to do is anything that I can do that I see society, all those issues, we try to talk about. It. And I listen to their opinion. But how would, yeah. I mean, I think one of the biggest differences, the difference between being a thermometer and a thermostat. Have you ever heard of that difference? You know, um, a, a thermostat, right? You know, a thermometer tells you the temperature. It tells you the temperature. You look at a thermometer, it tells you what temperature it is right now. But a thermostat regulates the temperature. You see, as men, we're meant to be thermostats. We're meant to come into an environment and regulate the environment. You know, you hear the famous words, daddy's home. So you know what that means, right? You know, the mother, the woman, she's coming to you telling you all the things that the kids did all day while you were out. And they know when you walk into that house, you're regulating the temperature. You're the one that sets the tone now. All the stress, all the things that were going on, you're coming and you're bringing that calming presence. And that's the power that we embody as men. We're meant to be that thermostat. You know, you don't come in there and let the environment, you're being regulated by the environment. You come in there, you're regulating the environment, saying, okay, this is how it's gonna be now. Now that I'm home, all the stuff that was going on, okay, that's fine, but daddy's home now. And so, and, that, and that's the power that, and you can do that not just in our homes, but when we begin to regulate the environment in our home, we can regulate the environment in our communities, and we can regulate the environment in our cities, and that's what the thing about what this represents is that we're regulating the environment. Now. We're saying, okay, we're no longer gonna be dictated by what's happening, we're gonna dictate what begins to happen in our society and, and in the you know greater community around us. And, and I think that that was the lesson that my dad, when my dad say, um, always talk about the ghosts, what he said is that you have to go through what you have to go through to realize, he always said that I don't care what I've been through, ain't nobody gonna tell me what I need to do. I'm my own man. I don't care, when, when the pressure comes, what determines what type of man we are is from the pressure that comes our way. Are we still gonna stand for our beliefs? Are we still gonna fight for what we believe in? I mean, a guy asked me one time, he said, you know, he said, so what do you, what would you die for when he first asked me that question? You know, and I, I couldn't really answer it. But I can answer it now as my conscious contact with God. Because if I don't keep God first, I can't be of service to my family. So that has to be the number one. And honestly, that's what I do with my kids. It's like, it's funny when I look around for me, I don't care what society's doing. When I look around and I see my sons praying without me, you know, I let them find their own way, but I know that they know there's a higher power bigger than his dad, and it's not me. You know, and whenever they're in trouble, I know that they can go to a book. They can go to the book of God. They can go to the Bible, and they can read, and they can search for something higher. All our kids know that. It's like, nah, I ain't going to control that. You can do whatever you want to do. Even my oldest son, he can go through whatever he wants to go through. I mean, one time he was going to do something real bad, and I seen him over in the corner reading the Bible. I said, all right. Yeah, all right. Because that's the one thing I think that, to me, I think the loss and balance in our society is that our kids don't have a higher, that, that, that ultimate God to go to. Society has stripped it away so much that kids are being raised by the internet. They're being raised by things, by music, by all these other things. So our, our spiritual foundation is so dead. You would ever think I'd be thinking, like, because I used to hate Sunday school on Sunday. You know what I'm saying? And you know, you get dressed up, you know, they, and that's what I had had. Your mom be pulling your head back, smack all that grease on your face. You got to walk up with that bow tie, go to church, right? And you fall asleep in Sunday school and all that. But guess what? When the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And I think that's what's so, so important. When we think they're not listening, it is going into the subliminal. And when trouble comes, and, I, and that's probably, a, to me, that's another thing that I think that happened. When we think they're not getting it, we change the curriculum. We don't have to change the old curriculum. It worked. It's those things that mind, body, and spirit that we put in. We put them in so when it's time for them to pull it all on themselves on their own, they can make those appropriate decisions. Yeah. I mean, would you agree? Yeah, I mean, the moment we step out here, there are like hundreds, thousands of kids who don't have fathers. A lot of the boys in here are fortunate because our, the fathers are present in their lives. And there are a bunch of kids out there who don't have this. And so whenever you go out there and you see kids wandering in the street, you see them and you're wondering, you know, where's the father figure at? Where is that? And if our if our mindset is, well, forget it. I mean, that's 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 their issue. Their issues become our issues, right? You know, I it's it's like you can't you can't ignore the reality of what's happening. Some people say we're living in the most fatherless fatherless generation that has ever existed. Meaning that there are fathers, but there aren't fathers, right? There are men, but there aren't enough fathers. And it doesn't have to be your biological child. It takes that father's heart to see someone who's going astray and say, you know what? I can help to influence that person. I can help to impact that person. And so just realizing and recognizing that as men, 
you know, our influence goes beyond just our own biological children. It can extend. And as, and as God trusts you with, he trusted you with a child, but then he's also entrusting that you'll be kind of like that, that, that barrier, that standard, that watchman on the wall. And say, no, this can't, this can't happen while I'm here. These kind of things can't be okay while I'm here. I need to figure out how to impact and how to change things, how to change what's happening around here. And if we all just ignore it and say it's someone else's problem, it all becomes our problem. It all becomes our issue. And so I think we're in a unique position now with some of the opportunities about the one out of 100, with the scholarships, a lot of the things that we've been talking about to really impact. Yeah, and I think what, what he's talking is like, I know for me, the one thing that hurt a lot for me when I was coming up, when you took away the community centers. My state was a community center. Free lunches, counselors who cared, you know, summer jobs, all those things that the dojo gives. But when we look in our society, where can our kids find that reinforcement? Everything's so much about making a dollar and not about giving your heart. Those, those environments that allow people that really care, you know, to give their hearts and souls. Like when we walk through the door, I know all of you guys come, through the, come in here, when my boys go out, they're gonna have good examples. The moment you give your kids, you bring your kids here for me to teach them in return, you're teaching mine. So in return, we become a family. We become that village of men that's going to you know, guide our kids and, and be there for our wives and protect the environment and make sure nothing bad comes, comes in. And, that, and think about it. That's a little spiritual thing. In, in a short amount of time, it just happens. Men learn to respect men, we, how we nod, how we, how we like, you know, do something like that or something like that. We don't have to go all out our way. And I think what, what we've been trying to do, because once again, my mission is that if I don't give it away, I done failed. I done failed. I don't care what. It's not just in the dojo. I got to give it away in order to keep it. And I got to see the impact that it has with all these other people. So I know that a lot of people talk it like you say, but they don't show up and do it. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, my sons call me daddy, not dad. Or sometimes daddy. Daddy and dad is so powerful. I call my dad, dad. That's like a, it's like a love thing. You know what I'm saying? It's like, dad. You, you see how that's, dad, daddy. That's a whole nother thing. And as a father, that means a lot. That means that we done went beyond just being a father who's just like a, 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 a term, but there's no emotional connection to that. That daddy or, 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 or what's up, Pop? What's going on, Daddy? Dad, my man, that's my dad. He's my oldest son. What's going on, Pop? How you doing, Pop? As a, We don't say it much, but you can imagine the emotional impact that it has on us. So, like you said, how do we extend that? Because we are a, 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 a mentor. A mentor is a dad, you know, a, or I, I don't, I'm not even talking about teacher. I'm talking about a mentor, a model for other people. So one of the things that he was talking about is that we have this crazy dream where our mission is to away one million scholarships all over the world. And basically, it's the principles of martial arts. And we'll talk a little bit more about that because, I mean, but I think we all got to find a way, how do we give our message? Because we all have a unique way of giving, you know? And how do we give it? Every time you come in, we give, it's, that's all we got to do. And it's like, and it just happened. You know, it's, sometimes we give a nod. Sometimes we crack a joke on each other when we come through the door, right? <laughs> but it's, it's those little things where we feel comfortable. I go out my way to say hi to you. I know you be in your work, but you'll see me go out my way to make it present. Because how many men walk in a room and don't even say hi to each other? I don't even understand that. Why do we walk? You know what I'm saying? Especially in the street. It's like you walk by and you won't even look at each other. You won't even say hi. We don't even open doors for women anymore. We don't even open doors for our wives anymore. We don't even let them sit down before we sit. So we have, I mean, man, I thought it was bad when I was coming up. We have a hell of a job on our hand right now. But I know we, we starting here, can answer that call because it's a natural part of what we're doing. Mr. Tony, you had your hand up. I think the key word to what y'all been, a lot of y'all been talking about is identity. As men, as fathers, as husbands, we are, we are the primary, we are primarily responsible for setting the identity for our children. And that's one of the things that I've seen that's very, that's very lost in, in, in society today. Society, 
feels that it has that it should take more of the responsibility or the responsibility of setting the identity for our children. And that is not true. Uh, one of the things that my dad did for me um, as a single dad uh, was I'm the first of three kids, and my father told me that I'm his first boy, which meant that there's a responsibility and and kind of an honor to that. Not one that I've earned, but one that, that I have to learn to, to step into because my dad's not always going to do that. My dad was military, so same situation. He may not always be there. So I had to be prepared to step in for the day that he wasn't there. And that's the identity he set for me from, you know, back when I, I, I could remember, so I could first understand and realize. So, and that, that carried out to, you know, who I am today. And I am very thankful for that to this day. My father set the identity for me back when I could, back when I could first understand it. And I think that is very, very important today. And it's very, and it's even more important because society is, is, is fighting to take that responsibility from us. You can't let them do that. And, and you know, one of the things, go ahead, go No, I'm going to say just to, to respond to that, I think to you, to that point of identity, it's in a sense of society and in a sense of you know, where we kind of all stand collectively, there is a lot that is starting to write the the strength of what a man is and then his place in the household and society not completely out but almost diluting it to the point that it makes it that much more difficult where it's like you're fighting to have that representation that you are and what you are in society because of the image that's being presented of, of who and what you are so it's like you, you shouldn't have to fight just to, just to basically, you're fighting to, to stay in your place that you were born to, but you, you're supposed to be there. You're supposed to have that role, but now you're fighting for all of these other things just so that you can be in that role. And it's like you're fighting two wars at the same time. You know what I mean? And to your point, as far as identity, it's, it's taking all of that out of you. And so it's like, all right, I gotta fight. I gotta fight society so that you know my kids understand what a man is. But then I gotta actually still show them at the same time. So it's like <laughs> you find yourself kind of basically causing crossfires, literally, literally everywhere you go. So and, and that and, and that's probably so powerful. And that's that's like that that thing in a room that we don't want to talk about, but we gotta talk about it because it is wherever you look. It can be so confusing on what we supposed to do. What, what's the word? Toxic masculinity. It's sometimes I supposed to be a warrior. I supposed to stand up and fight. And you can't call that toxic masculinity. If energy comes that's more aggressive than what I'm feeling, is I gotta control that energy. I don't suppress that energy because when we really think about these things, they're against nature. It's important to have positive and negative. And in the midst of the negative, the strength. There is love. And in the midst of love, there is strength. But one without the opposite energy is not natural. So when we begin to really examine, that's what I, you know, I always tell my boys research what I tell you. Because if you can find it in the Bible and find it in a book of, of, of knowledge, you know that I'm saying the right thing. And I think that's so important. Now what happens when you take that away from a child and you're telling them to go to social media or Google, you ask the kid, what is Webster? Oh, what is Webster? Well, why do, I don't want you to go to Google and do it. I want you to go to Webster's and then see what Google has to say. So those are the things that we gotta go back to. And, and like what you were saying with a lot of, what, I, what we gotta recognize, that's why this is even more important now. I mean, there's a group, there are men are rising up and they taking their kids out. We gonna show you how to shoot. We gonna tell you how to hunt. We gonna show you how to be a man. We gonna, we gonna take away all the technology and everything. We gonna go out there and we gonna live in the cabin. We're going to learn how to survive when things come, which our dads taught us. And I think that's why this is so important. we got to show them how to stand up and fight and be ready for that moment to come. Because I don't care what happened. You can, tell, you can say, Johnny, don't mess with me. Or tell a teacher. But we, when we look at everything, even the school system doesn't provide a safe haven for them. 
There is no, there is, it's like, it's almost like there is no wrong. It's always right. Everybody's right. We know that's unnatural. That is unnatural. You can't live in a society where that's, that, that's taking place. So to me, I think it goes back to that question that person asked me, what are you willing to die for? I'm willing to stand up for what keeps me connected to the righteous way that God created me to be. And for that, I got to be that living example for everybody else. Everybody that I come in, come in contact with. And I got to collect with other men that allow us to come together so we can be those warriors. Because that's what I got to teach my boys. You got to be warriors. You got to be ready for the unexpected. And that's why we practice. You got to know the martial arts. You got to know some of the things that I, I see that I got to learn and I got to teach them. Like when we did our super fight. We got to come and teach firearm safety. I used to have this crazy thing about guns. But then I realized that if they better are educated about it, they more or less likely to want to use it. Am I correct, firearms instructor? Can you elaborate a little bit on those, like those energies of aggressiveness, how important it is to be educated? Um, oh, wow. That's, that's, that's a big one. So, um, just, just combat in general. In the world we live in today, there's always going to be some type of combat. Always under some type of combat, and you have to you have to find a way to be ready for it. Um, ultimate goal is to is to de-escalate it or avoid it as much as possible, but that's not always going to be possible. So you always have to be ready for it. In the case of firearms, um, especially in today's world where 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 you know first-person shooter video games and stuff like that are are running rampant and, and relevant, it kind of takes away the the um, the real effect, the consequence of of firearms, and throw on top of that, where society is teaching you, well, it's the gun itself that's killing people, not the person handling it. Um, putting out the education on on firearms, like you said, actually actually shows you that hey, if you do it right, then chances are much, much less than things will go wrong with it. And if, if people know, especially kids, know the actual consequence of firearms, they're less likely to, uh, uh, you know, to play with them or be frivolous with it. Um, just a little background on me, I'm, I'm, I'm 23 years military, I'm an extra pistol shot, I'm a rifle marksman, and I've, I've been a training officer uh, in my squadron. Uh, rifle, uh, a firearm training officer in the squad. Um, I enjoy shooting, and um, you know I think that that it is it, it is a, a, a an actual usable you know skill to know. But you know above all, along with the, along with learning that skill, is learning the safety that comes along with it, that is required with it. Anytime you see it, anytime you touch it, the safety that has to that has to first pop into your mind whenever whenever you're around it. So, um, yeah, it's, it, you know, knowledge is power, especially in that case. Okay. One sixty. Uh, I was going to say, um, you know, what we need to impress upon our kids as far as firearms is concerned is that we need to, if you have them, lock them up, store them in a place that you can't use. I was uh, thirty years Marine Corps. And uh, I have several weapons from that time, but I don't use them now. They're all secured, locked up in the safe. I probably don't even know the competition for those safe because I haven't used them in, since I retired in 2016. But um, we need to impress upon that these things are weapons that destroy people's lives. Not just the person who gets shot, but the family <coughs> in your life and your family because now you have to suffer the consequences. Even if you were doing it justifiably, now you're going to be out of the pocket and money and legal fees and everything else because now they have to find you not guilty or not responsible for what you did but even though you did it it's it just you know weapons take a toll no matter which way you use them in our society um, you know if you use them in a war you have a justification the government justifies that if you use them on the street not so much even if you're in the right and, and I think what and we're talking when we think of all of that right there even learning a combat art there's accountability that goes along with that. You know, that's why everybody see it as fighting, but it's the art of fighting without fighting. You learn to fight and take yourself to the masses level of, of exertion where you can't go no more, 
Because once you become, as my dad say, once you understand that ghost, then you don't want to deal with that ghost anymore. You know how to tame it. You, done, you, you are a little bit knowledge reigns supreme over all things. Now you have knowledge of where a person can't take me to. Like we take in martial arts. You know, the bands, we're going we gonna to give them a bust to lift. 